in this lecture, we're looking at the Oxford movement and the changes that it wrought within Anglicanism as well as in other church traditions within Protestantism. And the context that we're looking at here is the same that we've looked at for the past two or three lectures, which is as the Enlightenment has radicalized and as there is an increased desire within members of the church to react against the liberalizing tendencies of certain segments of the population, whether it's people that are embracing a truncated view of certain doctrines or expelling certain doctrines entirely, or more importantly at times, if it's changes within the political order, as you see a rising nationalism and a political liberalism within certain sectors of society, or at times there is a nationalism that comes with a renewed conservative ethos that challenges some of the ways that the church had engaged with society in earlier decades or centuries. And we should begin by just defining what the Oxford movement is. For some of us, the Oxford movement is at least well-known in general, at least by name. For some of us, maybe those of us who are Anglican, there's an ongoing debate about the rightness or wrongness about some of the conclusions of the Oxford movement. Still, for others, the Oxford movement is coming out of left field. Maybe you've never heard of it. Maybe it's something that's new. Maybe you're wondering what all the fuss is about. Well, put simply, the Oxford movement is a trend begun in Oxford in the 1830s that carried on for decades and that spawned something that we today call Anglo-Catholicism. The most famous person within the Oxford movement, of course, is John Henry Newman, but there are others like John Keeble, etc. And the Oxford movement is a set of beliefs and a set of instincts, you might say, to try to recover the Catholic, medieval, and patristic heritage within the Anglican Church. It's a rewriting or a rediscovery, in some cases, of history. It's making the case that Anglicanism has a history that ought not to be overthrown in the light of modernism and rationalism. But we need to go ahead and start with one caveat, one myth right here. For a number of students of mine, particularly those who come from low church backgrounds or from other denominations, when they think Anglo-Catholic, they tend to think smells, bells, vestments, collars, and a number of the external things that are associated with a high church liturgy. And we want to say right now, the Oxford movement is not a liturgical or a movement that is only focused on the veneer, the externals. The Oxford movement is a theological and a historical movement. It begins to affect liturgy, investment wearing, and certain assumptions about what all these things mean, of course. But it's not simply the beginning of the use of incense. There had been incense used actually for quite some time in lots of different denominations. It's not simply wearing a collar. The Oxford movement in Anglo-Catholicism is not a movement of the externals. Rather, it is another one of these movements that we've seen, just like Vatican I in the Catholic Church, and just like fundamentalism and evangelicalism, that says no to the liberalizing and the progressive tendencies within certain segments of the church. In this case, it starts in Oxford by a group of scholars and writers. And the Oxford movement gets going in particular in the year 1833. What happened was the government, the parliament, passed a number of legislations that updated and changed certain things within the Irish church. And this set, in particular, John Keeble off. Now, you have to understand what is going on here. This is still a state church. This is still a church in which parliament and the crown really govern and dictate and can change things, in general at least, if they wish. In this sense, it's not all that dissimilar to Henry VIII or Elizabeth or Mary Tudor changing things in the church when they were king or queen. So Keeble is concerned that there is a liberalizing modernism that is taking root in particularly the political orders that is going to put in jeopardy the more traditional theological understanding of the Orthodox faith. And so in 1833 at Oxford, Keeble preached a very famous sermon called National Apostasy, in which he argued that the world was essentially falling apart, that this liberalizing, rationalizing tendency was causing people and provoking people to update and change their theology to meet the demands of the day. And he argues for a return to historicity, to the patristic age, and to the Catholic ethos of what it means to be Anglican. Well, flowing out of that, there arose the Tractarian Society, or the Tractarians, as they're simply known as. And these are a number of other Oxford people who actually buy into what Keeble says, John Henry Newman, etc. And they begin to publish a series of these short books or tracts on all manner of different ideas and doctrines and historical principles about the origins of the Anglican Church. 
And the tracks are important because they're not simply a rediscovery of the history of the Anglican Church. Rather, they are a new interpretive grid as to how to understand Anglicanism. The tracks argue a number of different points. There are all kinds of them. But there are two main focuses, two main goals within the tracks that we need to highlight. First and foremost, the tracks go back to the 16th century, to the Henrician and Elizabethan age, and they make a case that what is going on in that century is not a Protestant church that is emerging from a complex situation created by Henry VIII's break with the Pope. Rather, they argue that the Anglican church from the very beginning was actually Catholic. They point to things like the Book of Common Prayer, and they argue that the Book of Common Prayer was a very traditional medieval type of liturgy. They also point to the 39 Articles, which were promulgated under Elizabeth. And Newman in particular is big on this. He's the one who writes this tract. He argues that the doctrine, the theology, in the 39 Articles is functionally synonymous with the Council of Trent's theology about faith and works and other things. Now, we can go ahead and stop and just say, historically, the Tractarian Society is completely out to sea on this. And I don't mean that judgmentally. I just mean historically, it's just simply not the case. They are rewriting history when it comes to the 16th century. The Book of Common Prayer was never seen as a Catholic document. Catholics actually rioted in England over the Book of Common Prayer, even the very first one. Cramer's intentions, we now know, repeatedly, were to Protestantize the church. He was doing so in the teeth of opposition, which is why there were piecemeal steps. But it was not a Catholic medieval document. For one, there's only two sacraments. The Lord's Supper is described not as physical eating, but as spiritual eating. And it takes a fair amount of, let's just say, interpretive gymnastics to make any of these cases really stick. More importantly, the 39 Articles. The backbone of the 39 Articles is the 42 Articles, which were published just a couple of decades before. In those documents, the papacy is actually referred to as the Antichrist. (laughs) So um, the idea that Cramer and others are closetly Catholic, some via media midpoint between being real Protestant and being Catholic, just simply isn't the case in the 16th century. However, the Tractarians and the Oxford movement does do a couple of moves that are impactful and important. First and foremost, the real championing of a historic faith leads the Oxford movement to, on the one hand, put together uh, collected works of the Church Fathers to reground and make available to people the patristic witness that is the foundation for the Church in general. And this is actually a very important point. The original Protestant impulse is to say that the medieval Church had gone wrong, but that the patristic Church was more in line with the Reformed or Lutheran Church or the Anglican Church. There had always been in Protestantism until, frankly, around the 19th century, a strong belief that the patristic witness was part of the Protestant heritage. What the Tractarians are doing here is actually a good thing. They're saying, essentially, look, Jesus didn't get off the throne for 1,500 years. The church was still the church. Even if there are troubles and problems here and there, the church didn't start in 1,500. The other point that the Oxford movement makes is they do point out rightly that from Richard Hooker, who was writing during the time of Elizabeth, on into the Caroline Divines in the 17th century, there is a halting of the Puritan impulse within the Anglican Church that wants to throw everything out and really kind of go down to the essence of the church liturgy. There is, in other words, in the 17th century, a foundation of the Anglican Church that is going to privilege a historic liturgy, the wearing of vestments and these kinds of things. Now again, though, the Oxford movement reads this as a Catholicizing tendency. And more importantly, they're constantly making the case that all these Catholic proclamations from the Council of Trent, etc., are more or less synonymous with Anglicanism. And what this gives rise to is something that is known as the branch theory of the church within Anglicanism. And this is a more or less minority report, but it's the idea that Anglicanism never left the Catholic Church fully, that the line of succession of ordination, for example, was maintained, they argue. The Catholic Church denies this, of course. And they argue that the three branches of the church are the Anglican Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Catholic Church. Again, that's why it's called the branch theory. There are three branches of historic apostolic Christianity they are arguing. Now, notice who they're leaving out. Any other Protestant group is no longer part of the historic branch of the church, according to the Tractarians. And they're being very purposeful about this. The point, though, in all of this is why are they doing this? The Oxford movement got underway Again, as a response, as a conservative response to the movement of liberalism and modernism and rationalism 
that they feared was going to ruin the church. Flowing out of the Oxford movement, though, you do get Anglo-Catholicism. And Anglo-Catholicism is a crystallizing of some of these principles into an overt ecclesiastical and church structure that still exists until today. Now, Anglo-Catholicism, one more time, is not simply smells and bells and a high sense of liturgy. Again, there are plenty of Protestant denominations over the centuries that have that same instinct in general. Low church is not the only Protestant voice here. Rather, Anglo-Catholicism, if you were to go, say, to England right now and find a staunch Anglo-Catholic church, if you were to enter into it, you would find what people often describe as Catholicism without the Pope. There'd be all manner of traditional medieval understandings of the church. Prayers to the Virgin Mary, to the saints, concept of penance, so on and so forth. Again, it's not about externals. It is about the theology that is infusing the liturgy. But the Anglo-Catholic movement has continued on. And again, at times, people actually become Roman Catholic themselves. And this has always been one of the realities of the Oxford movement that has caused some who are not Oxford movement or Tractarian folks to look on the Oxford movement with suspicion. A lot of this is general anti-Catholic sentiment, but progressives within the Anglican Church and in the American Church also look on this with suspicion. But we can't equate the Oxford movement with Anglo-Catholicism entirely. The Oxford movement gave to us part of the context that makes it hard for the modern person sometimes to interpret the Anglican Church in its original context. Because despite the fact that the Oxford movement is wrong about its history of the 16th century, their voice and their understanding of these things has carried down until, frankly, the last generation or so of scholars. Cranmer is seen as not really Protestant. Anglicanism is seen as unique and on its own, fully, not part of the European Protestant world. It's this kind of English exceptionalism, this covenant church, this branch church of the historic faith, that becomes an origin story that, frankly, is still pretty commonly accepted by most people all the way until the modern world. Now, I'm not making the case here that the Oxford movement is a bad movement. It's not theologically suspect per se. It's not run by fools, to put it that way. The issue, though, is that this tends to happen, and this is the point, whenever you have a regrounding or a, quote, return to the original ethos of the founding fathers or whatever of any institution. There's always an element of rewriting the story to fit the context of what you're going for in your day. And that's really what you see here in the Oxford movement. It's not that they're fools, it's that they have an ax to grind against their day, and they're using some historical sensibilities to do it. The positive thing about this, though, and this is what I think the positive of the Anglican Church has been all throughout its history, but even more so in the modern world, is Anglicans are always those who do remind Protestants that they are part of a historic church, that they actually are based on the patristic witness, that even though there are problems in the Middle Ages, we don't throw out a thousand years of history and act like Luther was the first real Christian to ever walk the face of the earth. That type of exclusionary position tends to be very chaotically lived out in the context of certain churches within the context of the modern world. Beyond that, the better trends within the Oxford movement, native to Anglicanism itself, presses home the concern that they remember they don't overthrow things simply because they don't like them. Rather, there is a historic sensibility, a historic voice of Anglicanism that ought to be recognized. You might say that the Oxford movement gave the modern world, the modern Anglican, the modern Anglican church, the voice to say, this is who we are, and this is who we're not. Too often over the years, Anglicanism was more or less a wax nose. Not always, but again, it doesn't have a rigorous confessional body, and it doesn't have a body of texts like, say, Luther's works or the Reformed writings that birthed all the different Reformed denominations that came after. As we saw in the 17th century, at times, Anglicanism can be remolded and reshaped a bit too easily by those who are in power. The Oxford movement, though, brings to bear the reality that they're not going to put up with a redefining of what it means to be Anglican. Going forward then from the Oxford movement, even by those who are not Tractarian and who don't buy into the Catholicizing tendencies of the Oxford movement, there is now a more rigorous understanding within Anglicanism as to what it means to be part of that church. And so in the end, the Oxford movement is a conservative reaction against the liberalizing tendencies within Britain. They rewrite and redistribute some of the load of the focus of the church throughout history. They tell people to focus on the patristic witness in the medieval world, etc. The Achilles heel, though, is that too often they're shoehorning in Roman Catholicism within the Anglican context. 
than for those who do not agree with the oxygen movement. That's mixing oil and water. Still, though, even for those who reject the oxygen movement, what the oxygen movement gave to Protestantism in general and to the Anglican Church specifically is a grammar and a vocabulary and a context where people were again driven to the question as to what does it mean to be Protestant. Mm -hmm.